Hello and welcome to my next video on animal behaviour. So there are two types of behaviour you need to know about. Behaviour is firstly described as the responses of an organism to its environment which increases its chances of survival. Now the two types you need to know about is innate, which is kind of instinct, and learned, which is, as the name says, learned. Now the differences between them. Innate it's genetically determined, it's inherited from the parent. There is no environmental input. There's no learning involved, no modification of a behaviour. It's you it's evolved in the, by natural selection. It increases the chances of survival to reproduce, as it present in all members of the population. It's rigid and inflexible. It's very stereotypical, it's the same with all the organisms of that species, and it's relatively unintelligent. Learned behaviour is behaviour that develops um or changes through experience and it involves the genes and the environment. Uh, the animal develops the behaviour through perhaps trial and error. New behaviour is developed, old behaviour is modified, Be specific behaviour may not be naturally selected and individuals of population may show a variety of behaviours. And it comes from experience and it is intelligent. Now why we have it? Learned. We have learned behaviour if we have like long lifespan, so you have time to learn it, you have parental care so you can learn from your parents, and you generally live in a group so you can learn from each other's. Innate behaviour is for organisms with a short lifespan that don't really have parental care and don't generally live in a group. Though, however, it applies a lot to um, invertebrates, like insects, and lots of insects do live in groups, but generally if you don't live in a group, you won't have as much learned behaviour. Equally, you can be on your own and have learned behaviour. So firstly, innate behaviour. Now this thing is a lot about examples. So I'm going to go through examples which I found myself of these and go through what they actually mean. So we have reflexes, kinesis, and taxes. Taxis. Now a reflex is, um, well many invertebrates have an escape reflex, the function of which is to avoid predators. So it's equally, we have reflexes to make sure we don't hurt ourselves. It's basically something which you don't think about, you just naturally do to avoid danger. And the best example is the withdrawal reflex, which we all have. When you touch a hot object, you quickly pull your hand away using the withdrawal reflex. Basically, you touch something hot, it goes to your spinal cord, returns to your effector, and causes you to move your arm away. Next, we have kinesis. Now, kinesis literally means movement. And this is to do with the rate of movement. So you will respond to a stimulus by moving, increasing your rate of activity, but in no certain direction. Not You'll just move. Now, it might be, you know, if you, for example, humans, if they sense fire, suddenly panic and just run around because they know they need to move. But they're not moving anywhere in particular, they're just running around. Um, but the example here is wood lice, classic wood lice. Now, they like dark, moist areas, not light, dry areas. But what actually happens is if they are in a dry or light area, this will cause them to move more, but randomly. And it only stops, they only stop moving when they get in a nice, moist, dark area. So we we'll make, so this kinesis will not cause them to move to the dark area, it will just cause them to move until they happen to reach a dark area randomly. And finally, taxis. This is the directional movement response. Now, so you could have positive taxis and negative taxis. Positive is towards something, negative is away from something. For example, chemotaxis causes an organism to move towards a chemioattractant, but chemokinesis causes the rate of activity to increase due to a chemioattractant, but no in particular direction. So, the important thing is to know, kinesis is increased rate of movement, but in no direction. Taxis is moving in a certain direction. Learned behaviour. Now, first thing we're going to do is look at habituation. Habituation is when animals can learn to ignore certain stimuli because repeated exposure to the stimulus results in neither reward nor a punishment. It's basically to make sure you don't, you know, alert and use energy unnecessarily. So, for example, uh, here are three examples I've got. 
A turtle will draw its head back into its shell when the shell is touched. But after being touched repeatedly, the turtle realises it's not in danger and no longer hides. Uh, prairie dogs retreat into their holes at the sound of approaching human footsteps. When this occurs many times and the prairie dogs know the footsteps are not a threat, they no longer retreat. An abused cat is very wary of a human touch. Once it realises that its new owners pose no threat, it becomes used to petting. So that's the situation, just getting used to things. Imprinting. This involves young animals becoming associated with another organism, usually the parent. And now, the next three, imprinting, classical conditioning and operant conditioning, have very, very famous examples. Now, the first one is Conrad Lorenz. And he was basically a person who got who looked at goslings and got them to imprint on different things, most famous being his boots. I'm going to go through the whole experiment. So, Lorenz discovered that goslings would follow the first moving thing they saw on hatching. After that, they would only follow and learn from objects that looked like the first object. They did a few experiments on these goslings. In one experiment, he split a batch of geese into two groups. One group A were in their natural environment, and the other group B were hatched with Lorenz. Group A followed their mother, or Group B followed Lorenz, the first thing they saw. Even when the two groups were put together, the goslings from Group B would follow Lorenz, and Group A would follow the mother. So even if Group B saw their mother, they hadn't imprinted on her, so they followed Lorenz anyway. In a later experiment, the hatch goslings first saw Lorenz's wading boots. They would follow Lorenz whenever he wore these boots. In a third experiment, he discovered that if they saw a box on a model train when they hatched, they would follow it in a circle round a model train track. This showed that they could imprint on inanimate objects. So, Lorenz discovered that the period for imprinting occurred around 36 hours after hatching, and he named it the sensitive period. If the goslings followed the first thing they see, usually the mother, they will be safe and able to learn all the skills needed for life from their mother. Now, classical conditioning. This is where animals learn to relate a pair of events and respond to the first in anticipation of the second. This type of learning is passive and involuntary, and the best example is Pavlov, which we'll all know about. Pavlov was studying the process of salivation, so drooling, the amount of saliva produced and its composition. He'd observed that when dogs were shown food, or when they smelt food, they salivated. This is a normal reflex action. It is a response to an unconditioned stimulus. Now, he didn't actually want to see if he could get them to salivate, but he just wanted to collect their saliva. So he fed the dogs in order to stimulate them to salivate, because they salivate when they want food. He rang a bell when he was about to give the dogs food. He noticed that the dogs soon began to salivate on hearing the bell, even if they could not see or smell the food. This ringing is known as a conditioned stimulus, which leads to a new reflex action called a conditioned response. So, essentially, these organisms have a set response, which is salivating in response to food. That's unconditioned, that's natural. But, since they associate the bell with getting food, the bell becomes a conditioned response, causing them to salivate in expectation of food. Operant conditioning. This is learning that takes place in animals given punishment or reward to reinforce the performance of a particular operation. This is also known as trial or error learning. Trial and error. And the best example is B.F. Skinner and a Skinner box. Skinner used this Skinner box to test the behavioural reaction of rats and pigeons in response to rewards or punishments. Once in the box, animals would accidentally press a lever which produced a food pellet, the reward. This reward led to increasing frequency of pressing the lever because the animals had learned to associate the operation of pressing the lever with the reward of food. So basically they happen to associate an operation, that's why it's called operant, to an actual act, to a reward. Equally, they could also associate a uh, action with a punishment. So for, perhaps um, every time they press this lever they'll get a small electrical shock, soon they won't be pressing the lever anymore. Latent learning. Now this is exploration. Animals will explore new surroundings and retain information about their surroundings that is not of immediate use but may be essential to staying alive at some future time. And my example here is elephants. Elephants have a matriarchal system where they live in groups and follow a lead female, the matriarch. The female will usually be old, 60 years or more, and will have learnt through exploration the whole area in which the group lives. If there is a drought and they need to find a source of water, the matriarch will use her 60 years of knowledge, migration, every year, 
watching other matriarchs solve this problem to lead the elements to a location where she knows there has been a lot of water, thus saving the herd. So it's basically just learning from your environment. Ex exploration, learning, this is here, that is there. Insight learning, and this is the highest form of learning. It is based on the ability to think and reason in order to solve problems or deal with situations in ways that do not resemble simple, fixed, reflex responses, or the need for repeated trial and error. Once solved, the solution to the problem is remembered. And the example here is Wolfgang Köhler. Chimpanzees were presented with bananas hung out of the reach and set on boxes. The chimpanzees were able to stack the boxes on top of each other to reach the bananas. In another experiment, some food was placed outside a cage, out of reach of the chimpanzee. The only thing outside the cage, near enough to reach, was a stick. The chimpanzee took the stick and used it as a tool, meaning it could reach the food and pull it towards itself. So it was reachable with its hands. So it's basically just learning, you know, problem solving. And it's the highest form of learning. Also, if you're interested in what I'm currently reading from, this is an own resource I've made myself, a pack on animal behaviour I did for school. So I'm using that and I've used the textbooks and internet to find these examples. Primate behaviour. You need to know a very specific example, which is how primates behave. Now, primates have a hierarchy. This means that individuals have a place on the order of importance in the group. This is often shown by individuals higher up the hierarchy receiving more food or having rights of access to mates without in, um, individuals. Now, primates have large brains with a highly developed cerebral cortex. This is linked to social development and interaction. In particular, social behaviour. And social behaviour is grooming, they play with each other, they have parental care, they communicate with each other. As you can see, you can see it in the book and just read the example. But, um, yeah, it, they have a very social interaction with each other. And because of this, they can learn from each other. The, you know, the silverbacks, leads of the group, will teach the young ones how to fight, how to look after themselves, and they will learn from that. They will um, groom each other so they get that strong bond between each other. The mothers will have that bond between each other. And the advantages of this are... Females give birth to only one or very few infants at a time. This means that the maternal care and group protection enhances the survival rate of the young, because it's only looking after one, not, you know, ten. It also means that they can actually look after one. Some animals have hundreds of babies, and they cannot look after all of them, so they let them go on their own. The young learn by observing other members of the group and playing with them. Generally, other members of the group are alive because they've learnt how to survive. So if you learn from them, you're going to survive too. Now, the final relatively large brain size allows them, um, allows for this, you know, complex social behaviour. It takes a long time to mature. So, when you're young, you are quite immature, and having this parental care and social group means you're more likely to survive. Knowledge and protection of food sources is shared within the group, so you all know where food is. And also, there's a greater ability to detect and deter predators when you have a group. If you have a big group together, one predator is going to be scared off. If you're on your own, though, the predator could attack. And finally, looking at dopamine. Now, dopamine is a neurotransmitter and a hormone. It can act as both. It is a precursor molecule in the production of adrenaline and noradrenaline. And abnormally low levels of dopamine are associated with a number of diseases, including Parkinson's disease. Unfortunately, you have to be given more dopamine, obviously, but this uh, results in um, development of mental health conditions such as schizophrenia. It also been noted that patients with Parkinson's disease who are treated with L-DOPA, this uh, um, precursor to dopamine, are prone to behavioural changes such as compulsive gambling. Now, dopamine, there are lots of different types of dopamine and there are five main dopamine receptors from DRD1 to DRD5. Each of these are coded for by a separate gene. Binding of dopamine to its receptors involved in a number of processes including the control of motivation and learning is linked to regulatory effects on other neurotransmitter release. Now we say there are about 50 known variants of DRD4, so that's just one out of the five. The variants differ in specific sequence known as a variable number tandem repeat. Short section of nucleotide shows a different number of repeats in each variant. A number of studies have shown that some of these variants are implicated in certain human behavioural conditions. It's thought that the inheritance of particular variants with a DRD4 gene affects levels and action of dopamine in the brain. For example, ADHD, which is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. 
Drugs such as methylphenidate or Ritalin is used to treat ADHD and its effect on dopamine levels in the brain. A number of studies, a particular dopamine receptor variant of DRD4, has been shown to be more frequent in individuals suffering ADHD. Addictive and risk behaviours. A number of studies have suggested that particular variants of the DRD4 receptor gene are implicated in increased likelihood of addictive behaviours, including smoking and gambling. So basically, you get how these compulsive behaviours. So, just basically, this whole section on behaviour is just learn examples. Learn the pure definitions of what all these types of behaviours are, and then learn examples. Just look them up. Dopamine is just and a big example. So just read and learn that example. Nothing is hard in this animal behaviour section. Just learning the definitions and the examples. So in conclusion, we have innate behaviour and learned behaviour. We need to learn about primate behaviour and also the chemical about dopamine. So thank you for watching. Any questions as usual, leave in the comment section. And goodbye.